What will we talk about? We have to be uh, to make a bit of scope. Uh, what is really our problem? How we want to solve it? And also, what is the role of metadata in it? How can metadata help in the way? So we are talking about common access to EU information. And we have two things. We are running for the moment a big project really to bring all this information metadata together. So we are really in the scope of a lot of things which has been told this morning. And we will give some aspects which we think which might be useful also for you and give you some ideas how to handle different aspects. So what we have tried to do is to talk of metadata use cases, so to take different scenario which could help, which uh, show certain aspects around metadata, metadata in the context of publishing electronic contact on the internet. And we have selected five use cases. So the first is to talk a bit of structure, so to define formally what does your contract really look like, what are the relations, what are the different classes, metadata, and so on. And there we have a thing behind which is called the common data model, and which is based on something that we heard in the first uh, session this morning, uh, an ontology. So we are talking also here of semantic technology and the semantic. The second, also already mentioned a lot, we need to have some common information, some reliable information to be able to combine things. So we are talking here really of core metadata. So the minimal set of information that we require to be able to interconnect things and to uh, enable things like, for example, cross-domain search. The third thing is really how to relate content. So to talk of relations about different contents, to enable navigation through content, and there again also an important aspect, semantic technology, which helps us to create some of these relations in an automatic way. We are talking here of a thing called inference. One thing which is relatively important for us and a bit special is multilingualism. The European Union has 23 official languages. For us, all these languages are equal. So we have to treat every language with the same weight, and we have a huge uh, complexity which is introduced by this multilingualism. And last not least, also interoperability, because we, we have a lot of partners on both sides, from the production side and from the dissemination side. So we need standards, interoperability, that we can guarantee the exchange of information. And of that. Just a few words where we are. So the publication office is somewhere in the middle between the European institutions like the European Commission, the Council, the European Parliament. We are the publishing house of these institutions and we are publishing uh, the information of these institutions. Uh, we're getting the manuscripts, we're transforming this, this to the end product, either on the web or traditional publications. So, if we are talking of publications, we have on one side what we call the so-called official publication, which is essentially legislation, everything with this legislation inside the European Union, but we have also something which is more looking like uh, traditional publishing world, so that we call general publications, which are general uh, books about different subjects which may be of interest for the citizens of the European Union. To give you just some figures what we are talking about, so like I said we have 23 official languages. In general uh, we publish 22 because Maltese is a bit an exception, it's also published but not such on a regular base. And that means for the official journal here we are talking of a million pages per year. Uh, we have also public procurement, about 400,000 public procurement notices per year. And we are also dealing with consolidation of, of European legislation. For the general publications, we have about uh, 6,500 titles per year in 50 languages. 
dissemination, paper copies, online services. And we have also an aspect here, which is preservation. So we also have to preserve these things for the future paper archive, digital archive. The main online services today are the for legislation, it's ILEX for European law. We have EU Bookshop for general publications. TED tenders electronic daily, uh, uh, daily for public procurement and Cordis for research, which is sponsored by the European Union. So for the moment, like I said, we are in a big project and we are relatively advanced. So we are building up a new system and hopefully we will go in a parallel run beginning of next year. The idea behind was to really make available in one single place all metadata and digital contact, which is managed by the publication office, and this in a harmonized form. Why do we want to do this? First of all, to uh, guarantee a better access to the information to the citizens. But also, and here it becomes interesting, I think also for publishers, to encourage and to facilitate reuse of content and metadata, especially in the legal world we have <coughs> a lot of partners who are doing added value around everything which is European legislation. And last not least, like we said, we have also to preserve content and metadata and access to content and metadata over time. Now we are talking a bit of architecture, of IT, because Mark and myself, we are, if you remember one of the first sessions, they are the IT people with the question mark. We are both <laughs> on this corner of the domain, so let's talk a bit about architecture. Just to give you an overview, what is the architecture behind a system like this? Oh, we have no pointer here, but just to see you. So the backbone, we have a huge repository which we have divided in two sections of what we call a content, com content repository and a common metadata repository. The dissemination is split up in three layers. So the backbone is really this content and metadata layer. Then we have the index and search, and on top of it, the portals. We have seen the four portals that we have for the moment for the different types of information. What we want to build on top of it is what we call a common portal to really enable access over cross-domain access to this information. What is also important in this context concerning metadata, you see here we have a kind of post-production phase. Here we are doing two things. We are doing validation of the electronic content which afterwards is uploaded to the repository. So to ensure a homogeneous level of quality. And then we have also metadata production, that means that are the normal aspects of cataloging and legal analysis to enrich and to complete the metadata. But what is important, because we are living here in the world of the web, and we have also for some of these documents very strong time constraints, that means publishing time. So first of all, what we try is to generate a basic set of metadata automatically, which is good enough that we can publish. And one of the key factors there is something what we heard also about is to go more and more to content in XML process. Because if you have a good structure, a well-defined structure, you are able to uh, retrieve already uh, a good set of reliable metadata directly from the content. And what comes from the content, for example, the title, you could not have a better quality than the real title with these XML sets. Now I will hand over to Mark, who will explain you more in detail the different use cases. And indeed, uh, our unit, uh, our main unit, even right now, is uh, not so much uh, the book, um, but uh, much smaller units uh, information. Um, typically, in the case of legal data, this would be a uh, the law. In this case, it's actually uh, um, the so-called reach 
corrective for each regulation, which is uh, our regulation in the chemical domain. And in this case, what you see here, what we don't quite see here, is uh, the uh, English version of it. And you see uh, the title um, expressed uh, in English. But you also see a lot of uh, references uh, being added to it. Here, um, all sorts of references to the actual books uh, this particular documentary unit was published in um, by language. So we have a list of uh, so-called official journals in which this was printed on the 30th of December 2006. But also a number of electronic formats, even two in this case, PDF and TIFF, very often more than that. Plus a set of metadata um, that is uh, valid for all of these. So when actually this act was uh, published, so, so our equivalent to the date of publication, when it was uh, signed, uh, and so on. And uh, that allows to bring in a, a keyword uh, that uh, was uh, until now a bit missing. Um, well known as FUR, or the Functional Requirements for Bibliographic Records, which is, uh, uh, let's say, not the most sexy of uh, titles, but uh, key uh, to everyone working with metadata in a highly multilingual environment, as we are doing. We have a metadata associated with the uh, document itself, an abstract level, so the work, where it was done, when it was published, who did it, on its expression, so in which language it was done, uh, what is its title in a given language, and all its different representations, which might or might not have uh, their own ISBNs, DOIs, or, or other identifiers. So uh, one of them, and only one of them, and increasingly not, not even the most important one, is uh, the paper version, but we have uh, regularly uh, all sorts of uh, electronic uh, renderings, uh, PDF, TIFF, and now, of course, uh, increasingly also um, EPUB uh, and other ebook uh, formats. Now, um, in order um, to be able to do this, not only for the legal domain, but uh, for all the domains we have, uh, you recall there was a uh, general publications, tenders, and so on. We do something uh, that uh, Fran, uh, um, in his uh, talk, uh, rightly underlines as being key to this. We have a set of core metadata which we uh, uh, request uh, throughout the board and which we audit to ensure that uh, their quality is uh, sufficient. And those are more or less uh, the Dublin core. These are actually the ones we really insist on, like title, author, language, uh, publication date, and so on. Plus a few which we want to see, but which we don't necessarily prescribe, like a subject classification, uh, source information, and so on. Even though the um, subject classification is very important for us, and I'll come to that in a second. So this enables us to not only publish uh, the uh, text itself simultaneously in 22 or 23 languages, so we have here the English, the French, and uh, the uh, Estonian version of uh, the REACH Directive, uh, but also all the leaflets, uh, books, um, and the official journal itself that turn around this because very often we have supporting material that will give uh, more accessible information uh, on uh, things we do. Or also completely different sectors like research uh, being done on chemistry in this field or tenders citing this. Now, let's zoom in It doesn't ter work terribly well uh, here. Um, so what we have is a set of uh, 
subject classifications, which you've seen <coughs> before in English, and which should have now at this moment been zoomed uh, right in, but it seems uh, that the versions are not terribly compatible um, of PowerPoint. Be that as this, we have a situation that we have to do this uh, simultaneously again in 22 or 23 languages. So uh, what we do internally is to use codes for this, which we map only during display uh, to the English version or to the French, which is equivalent above, or to uh, the Estonian one in this case. This uh, Thedaros, which we use, is called Eurovoc and is actually maintained in-house. In addition, we use a few more subject classifications for more specific domains, but this is the one we use uh, throughout. Peter has already uh, highlight, uh, highlighted the importance of uh, standards to exchange our data, because uh, we are very much uh, providing data that can uh, later be aggregated. And uh, we are basically uh, using Dublin Core for the absolute minimum core metadata, as I've just said. We are exposing, um, at least toward the portals, all our data according to linked open data principles using so-called RESTful web interfaces, so essentially uh, you can get to it using HTTP. Um, and expressing this uh, in uh, RDL, uh, RDF uh, OWL, so going very much uh, towards uh, um, the standards exposed uh, right at the beginning. We also expose a way that you can actually query this data, do extractions, and uh, using a standard query language for RDF called Sparkle. That way, uh, we enable everybody um, to launch queries and to get back the results in a standardized way that can then be uh, exploited.